the Shark Deck. Hey, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Today is the worst day of the year because we're on the other side of Labor Day. And if you have a nine to five office job, today's always the day where the boss is like, OK, we are going to get back to work. New initiatives. And everybody's like, wait, too serious. I hate today in the office. But luckily for me, this is my real gig. So I'm just in the basement telling you that Shane Gillis will make his Netflix debut today. His special is called Beautiful Dogs. This was filmed earlier this year in Virginia. Looking forward to that. Little Matt Reif controversy. See, I had put away the story about Matt Reif being profiled by Men's Health and Matt Reif telling you about the Matt Reif workout. We'll get to that. But uh, I saw a story on What's Trending, which said comedian Matt Reif, extremely popular on social media, is no stranger to controversy. In a recent interview with Men's Health, the comedian stated that, quote, no one wants to laugh at pretty people, unquote. Well, those comments were not well received and spawned numerous satirical impressions and commentary on women in comedy. Now, briefly after the initial interview clip was released, several TikTok creators are revisiting more of Rife's comments in his video interview with the magazine. Rife has advised new gym goers to focus on building chest muscle, saying that building a chest is so important you want to have the chest of a man, not a 12-year-old girl. While many fitness aficionados understood Rife's point on a technical level, many felt that insulting 12-year-old girls in the process was uncalled for. Digital creator Big Bro Bear accused Matt Reif of casual misogyny towards young women and body shaming other men. At the time of this recording, Reif has yet to comment on Men's Health Gate. All right, on to the original story I had parked away for today. From Men's Health, comedian Matt Reif shares the workout that keeps him sharp on stage. Reif told Men's Health, I'd love to box Harry Styles. High stakes, loser gets kissed on the mouth. Straight up, bring your A game or don't, whatever. I'm taking a dive in the second round regardless. More seriously, Rife said, I realized how much of a release working out is for your mental health more than even your physical, so it quickly becomes addicting. Then after you see the physical results, it becomes even more addicting, and you go, okay, how hard can I really push this thing? I hear you on that. I I mentioned I've been training for the marathon. I ran an awful 13 yesterday, just awful. It was a step back week, and I should have been much stronger. But hey, sometimes you bunk. But like the weight's coming off, and like I kind of want to run today. I shouldn't because I'm stiff. And my running guru, Hal Higdon, preaches about the importance of rest days. I'm going to rest my legs. I could be stronger tomorrow. But yeah, I want to run today. Rife says he tries to work out every day while he's on the road. A few hours before he hit the stage before the first of his two shows recently, he underwent a taxing leg day that had him thinking, it's so stupid to do that before two shows. I'm busy 23 hours a day. I sleep terribly. So that one hour a day at the gym is my hour to stay focused on my body and make myself happier. All right. Matt Rife's favorite workout moves. You got a pen and pencil and a paper or whatever you write on these days. You got a notepad on your phone. Matt Reif does. Alternating incline press, three sets of 12 per arm. Pull-ups, three sets of 8 to 10 reps. Zotman to reverse Zotman curl. I don't know what that is, but you do three sets of 8 to 10 reps. A Russian twist with a med ball, three sets of 10 per side. Loaded plank, three by 10. Plank mountain climbers, three by 10. Bulgarian split squats, three sets of 8 to 10 per leg. Bill Maher got into it with Joe Rogan appearing on the Joe Rogan Experience. Rogan told Bill Maher that he believes Joe Biden appears frail, that he's, quote, skeletal thin. Bill Maher agreed that Trump looks more healthy and robust, calling him a city roach. The worse things he eats, the stronger he gets. Rogan said he's also the only president who didn't noticeably age. Bill Maher said, no, we did, but he's a criminal and he's crazy and he's stupid. And crazy and stupid are two different things. Stupid is Frederick Douglass is alive or the stealth bomber is literally invisible or health care is hard to solve. Crazy is it's important that the crowd at my inauguration is the biggest ever, and I'm going to make an issue of this for the first two weeks of my presidency, despite photographic evidence of the controversy. Or, another example from Bill Maher, I'm going to steal these documents, and I'm going to put them next to the toilet at Mara Largo, and I'm going to fight you to take them back. We're not conceding the election. Those things are crazy. You're thinking I can charm Kim Jong-un in Korea, although that might be stupid. Sometimes it crosses the line between both, but he's both stupid and crazy, and he's also a criminal. Rogan then reeled off some of the charges Trump is facing. Maher noted Trump still hasn't conceded the election. Bill Maher said he tried every possible way of stealing the election. He tried to do it through the courts. He tried to do it through the legislators. He tried to do it through intimidating Mike Pence. He tried to do it through the Justice Department. They talked about seizing voting machines. They talked about using the army. You can't really believe this guy is not worse than Joe Biden. I agree. Joe Biden is not a great president, and the Hunter Biden stuff is a stinky scandal that stinks to the high heaven. But if you think that compares to what Trump tried to do, then you just cannot tell unlike things apart. Rogan asked Bill, do you think he really believes they stole the election? Bill Maher said, who gives an F? It doesn't matter. All the people around him told him he lost, and one of his quotes they have on record was, I don't want people to know I lost this election. 
Rogan said, that's kind of crazy. Moore said, he's a clinical case of malignant narcissism. It's not a quirk. It's actually in the big book of crazy. It affects everything he thinks and does. It's why authoritarian leaders were able to curry favor from him. They kiss his ass and got whatever they wanted. I think Putin had him as soon as he said, I think Trump is a brilliant man. Again, Biden's not my first choice, not my hundredth choice, but the other guy is a crazy, stupid criminal. Send your letters to Bill Moore, courtesy of the Joe Rogan experience. Hey, let's change the topic completely now that half the audience is throwing rocks at their iPhones. Well, soon on your iPhone, you'll be able to listen to a new Rolling Stones album. Hackney Diamonds is the Stones' first studio album since 2005. They'll give us all the details tomorrow. You're going to want to get up early at 930 Eastern. Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Ron Wood will be interviewed by Jimmy Fallon. The launch event will be hosted and streamed on YouTube. Over the weekend, we lost Jimmy Buffett. I was, like, for real, like, super sad Saturday morning, like, totally bottomed out. My friend Dave broke the news to me via an email, and I was on my way to the beach, and I thought to myself... Jimmy would want me to go to the beach today. So I drove the two hours down the Jersey Shore listening to Jimmy music, and I totally bottomed out. I almost did a bonus episode from my phone, but I, I've been trying to tie Jimmy Buffett into comedy. There's really nothing other than the Dusty Slay, It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere bit. If you haven't heard that one, it is fantastic. Here's a quick taste. I do like that song, It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere, though. There's a line in the chorus where he says this. He goes, it's only half past 12. That's 1230, just to be clear. <laughs> He said, it's only half past 12, but I don't care. It's five o'clock somewhere, All right? But that's not true. You know what I mean? It may be 5.30 somewhere. But... Rest in peace, Jimmy Buffett. Thank you for a lot of great concerts over the years. And in the words of Jimmy Buffett, if we couldn't laugh, we'd all go insane. Chris Rock and DJ Diplo have busted out of Burning Man. Have you heard about the floods there? Now, according to Chris Rock via the San Francisco Gate, Rock said no one can clean or empty the portable toilets. Quoting Rock, from what I understand, because of the flooding, the porta potties reportedly can't be emptied. And because the gates are closed, people can't get in to fill generators or deliver supplies. KTVU TV said Chris Rock didn't say why he was leaving, other than he just wanted a quote effing cold brew. Rock was seen in a blue New York jacket, the wind whipping in his hair, according to KTVU. Sam Marill tweeted, being trapped at Burning Man seems almost as bad as being trapped in a conversation with someone who went to Burning Man. Did you watch Office Race on Comedy Central last night? No, I forgot as well. But good news, it's streaming on Paramount+. Plus. The New York Times reminds us that Beck Bennett stars as Pat, a lazy, quasi-oafish sales rep at an investment app startup. Pat decides to train for a marathon. You know those weirdos. Hi. The New York Times says Beck Bennett makes for an adequate schlub and his journey from the couch to 26.2 miles is satisfying. If a bit too familiar, we get the usual sports movie beats from training montages to motivational speeches. The Times adds the sporting cast is uniformly great. J.B. Smoove is a champion race walker who advises Pat to partake in dipping tobacco to fortify his lungs. Kelsey Grammer has a small part as a former coach turned owner of a sports store. But the Times says the office race MVP is Joel McHale as Pat's maniacal, pun-loving boss and race rival, Spencer. Spencer chugs energy drinks, has sex with Pat's girlfriend, and goes insane in an obsessive pursuit of marathon glory. Good cast. Joel McHale, Beck Bennett, Kelsey Grammer, Allison Hannigan, J.B. Smoove. Try Paramount Plus for that. One of my favorite shows is, I just call it The Lakers Show. It is properly called Winning Time on uh, HBO Max, which isn't even a thing anymore. Sorry, Max. You guys blew that with that name. Anyway, The Lakers Show. Are you watching it? It's really good. One of the characters on The Lakers Show, Jeannie Buss. Well, in real life, Jeannie Buss just got married over the weekend to Jay Moore. TMZ says a small intimate ceremony in Malibu. 20 close friends and family members were in attendance. Friday asked Paul F. Tompkins, how do you create a character when you're doing podcasts? You've kind of moved away from impressions. Paul F. said, I started doing Comedy Bang Bang in 2009, and I think my first few appearances were over the phone. I did impressions I knew I could do that already came out of doing Best Week Ever, and impressions is very loose because it was caricatures, essentially of famous people. Then I started looking for more voices that I could do when I started my own podcast, and then, I don't know, 2015, 2013, something like that. I think the first one I did was maybe J.W. Stillwater, the idea of like, I'm tired of doing these people who are tied to the real world, that felt like a limited thing to me. If I make a person out of whole cloth, then I'm not confined to that. There's no anchor to the real world. It could just be whatever it wants. It was also my way of learning improv without going to take classes. <laughs> the biggest lesson for me was being okay with failure because I've always had a perfectionist streak control problem and it would bum me out when things that I want to do, things I'd put on stage on a show didn't work. 
when there are a lot of moving parts, if a thing didn't get pulled off properly, it made me mad. It made me mad to have to rely on other people that way. It made me mad I wasn't able to communicate the thing I wanted to communicate adequately enough. It made me mad that I only had one shot at it and I couldn't do it again. It didn't work the way I wanted it to work. So doing characters and doing improv, that's the whole thing that's built into it. Sometimes it's not going to work and you have to be okay with it and move on. John DePierce got asked about cancel culture. Why? Because she's a comedian and all comedians get asked in every interview about cancel culture. John does answer. You're shooting yourself in the foot. In 25 years, there'll be no reality of what was going on in 2023. First of all, there's free speech. Second of all, you're missing some great laughs. The world today is so crazy. I'd love to be canceled. It'd be so cool and great publicity. I'm not politically correct. I've been crafting a long letter to Dave Chappelle because I want to tell him, welcome to the family. The bottom line is comedy is a beautiful way to speak truth. It's a palatable way for your audience to accept truth. And that's all he did, speak truth in his opinion, and he gets beat up over it. Washington Post profiled Earthquake, and they said, hey, you had the Netflix special, you're popping up on TV shows. What's the goal here? Quake said, to have my own TV show and do more movies, I'm going to write a book, and I want to do select dates of comedy. I've been on the road for 32 years. I'm really trying to do like Dave Chappelle does. He works a lot, but he chooses where he wants to work and when he wants to work and how he wants to work. All right, Quake, what's the TV show going to be about? Earthquake said, I can't say too much about it, but it'll be based in Washington, D.C., about a government agency in D.C., and it'll be filmed in D.C. Did you ever think about quitting? Only one time, when I lost BET's comic view. Cedric the Entertainer talked me out of it. He was like, what else are you going to do? You're a great comedian. It lasted about 24 hours. I got back to it the next day. You can still have a meaningful career, even if you don't get commercial success. That doesn't mean you're not an artist. I learned when you do comedy, it's subjective. You might be funny to one person, but you're not funny to another. Doug Stanhope is going to star in the movie The Road Dog. The Road Dog tells the story of an aging alcoholic comedian. Good casting. Doug plays Jimmy Quinn, a veteran of stand-up comedy's glory days. Now, I'm wondering, uh, not having seen the movie or the trailer, when are stand-up comedy's glory days? Is that the 70s? Is it the 90s? Is it five minutes ago? I don't know. But in The Road Dog, when Jimmy's long-estranged son David, also an aspiring comedian, seeks him out, Jimmy offers to take him on the road and show him the ropes they begin to grow close, but tension rise due to Jimmy's self-destructive behavior. Ultimately, Jimmy must decide what he values most. Also in the cast, Tim Kazarinski and Greg Fitzsimmons. Do you hear my voice starting to go? I did a lot of shows into Labor Day weekend. I was also going to record next weekend, but now I'm not because I can't speak anymore. The film will be released digitally on October 6th. All right, let me tell you what really happened. I took a sip of my iced coffee and I recorded the rest of the podcast and then I looked and the file had stopped recording right when I took the sip. I don't know why it did that. It's not like I don't take breaks and take sips of coffee. I usually don't tell you about it. So now I have to do the final two stories again, but that's OK. A couple books are out today. Maria Bamford's is called Sure, I'll Join Your Cult, a memoir of mental illness and the quest to belong anywhere. These are the stories of the actual hilarious and harrowing scenarios that inspired her best-known material. It's less about the psychology of a comedian than it is a mental health memoir of a sensitive answers craving Gen X. Or London Hughes has a book out today as well called Living My Best Life, Hun. Following Your Dreams is no joke. It's a contemporary stab at the Dickensian formula, depicting how an outsider rose through the heavily structured British pop culture complex to make her dreams come true. And coming up in a week or so, it's the 2023 Milwaukee Roast Championships, a four-round tournament where comics slam one another back and forth. The semifinals are September 14th. The finals are in October. The organizers hope to forge connections with neighboring roast scenes like Madison and Chicago. That could lay the groundwork for a potential roast circuit. I say go all in. 30-team roast league. Today, New York City takes on Madison. You'd watch. All right, my voice is shot now, so I'm not recording any more episodes. I'm going to go do something else. Support my sponsors. Factor. Food's good. I'm telling you. DraftKings. Go Niners. Say no more. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your shows. All right, boss, let's have a meeting and talk about the fall initiative. Ugh, summer's over. I'm so sad.